Our sermon text today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter. And I want to give you a little background here before we get started. In the third chapter, we've got Jesus getting baptized. It's really kind of the starting of his, uh, his ministry, okay? So uh, before we go into the scripture here, I want you to kind of keep that in mind. He's just been baptized at the River Jordan. John the Baptist is baptizing. He's come up out of the water, and, and God's Spirit has come down upon him like a dove. And he hears the voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we give you thanks for this, your holy day. We give you thanks for this, your holy word. Lord, as we come this day, I pray that the message that is given and the words that are spoken will be yours. And as we gather in your name, O oh Lord, we as your people pray that the way that you use this message to change our lives will be according to your will. We will give you all the praise and honor and glory for the wonderful things that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. William Barclay says that after every high and uplifting moment, there comes a moment of reaction. A moment where we choose how we're going to react to the great thing that we've just experienced. And I just told you about Jesus' experience as an amazing thing. Can you imagine being there and, and watching that event take place? And hearing that voice from above. Could you imagine it in your own life? If you were told that. If you had accomplished something that great. How would you feel? That would be pretty uplifting wouldn't it? So when we're on those highest of planes. After, after these amazing things that have happened to us. Barclay says that's when we need to be the most careful. Because that's when we're most likely to be tempted. So listen for this reading of the Lord's word from Matthew. Chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. A couple of things I want you to know. First off, to be led by the Spirit, you have to be willing to follow, don't you? We hate that. Come on, be honest. Is there anybody out there that just loves to follow everybody? Right? I don't see any hands going up, so everybody's in the same boat with me. All right. We're, we're, we're good. We just don't like to follow. We want to do our own thing. We want to go our own way. We don't want anybody to bother us, especially with details. We, 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 we need to learn how to follow. Jesus follows. He's led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. Now, you've got to remember that Matthew's writing this gospel. He's very Jewish. He's writing it to Jewish people. He wants them to hear this word, wilderness. Jesus did indeed go out into the wilderness, but he wants to put this in the proper context. Because their ancestors, after they were delivered through the Exodus, the most, and by the way, if you're a Jewish person, that's, that's the most relevant part of your relationship with God was the fact that you and your people were delivered in the Exodus. And yet, right after that happened, they've seen all these amazing things. They spend an entire generation of 40 years in the wilderness because of disobedience. So Matthew's writing, he wants it to be known to the Jewish people that Jesus is the right kind of Israelite. He goes out into the wilderness and look how he deals with temptation. Now, the last thing I'd tell you about this first sentence is the word tempt really means test more so than we might originally think. When this, uh, when this original Greek test, uh, excuse me, text is translated into English for the first time, the, the word temptation really was a, a, a proper, uh, it, it really was a proper use of the word. Nowadays, it might be a little bit more appropriate to say tested instead of tempted, although it is a temptation, and you'll see that in a minute, but it's really a true test that Jesus is going through. It says, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. And the tempter came to him and said, since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. Now, this is not the first time that, that you've heard that phrase, God's son. And, and you'll hear it again in this context of this scripture. You'll also hear it again later if you continue to read through the Gospels as Jesus hangs on the cross and he's mocked and made fun of. As the chief priests and the, 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 those who put him there come up to the foot of the cross and say, hey, if you're God's son, get down from there. Help yourself out. 
Okay, so there's always that temptation thrown at Jesus, not just here in today's scripture, but later on as well. Jesus responds to this temptation by saying, it is written, people won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. See, he overcomes temptation. Uh, the other two scripture readings for the lectionary this week come from Genesis. And I want to read just a portion of that. It says, this is, you know, God has put the human mankind in the garden. Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. And he tells them, there's just one thing I want you not to do. Just one. Y'all remember what that was? Yeah, don't eat from that one tree in the middle of the garden. Just that one. You can have your fill, it says, of all the other trees. I just ask one thing. For all this bliss and blessing I've given you, I just ask one thing. A little, just a little obedience. We hate that too, don't we? Come on, be honest. We, yeah, we don't, we don't like being obedient either. But he says, I just, for all this, I just ask one thing. Don't eat from, from the, the tree of life. Because if you do, the knowledge of good and evil, it, it'll lead your death. And Satan comes along. It says the, uh, the serpent was the wisest of all the animals in the garden. And he comes along and he, and he says to Eve, now, you can eat from any tree, right? See how he twists that? And Eve says, no, can't eat from this one tree right over here. He says, why not? Well, God said if we eat from that, we'll die. Oh, surely you won't die. Surely you won't die. And Eve considers the temptation. Jesus doesn't. You notice that his response is almost immediate, and it depends on the word of God. That's some really good advice for us when we're dealing with temptation, by the way. Because when we try and deal with it on our own, and we try to reason with it on our own, we fail miserably, usually. When we depend on God's word for guidance, however, we succeed. And sure enough, as you know, the rest of the story, Eve takes the fruit, eats it, gives some to Adam. He eats it as well. And that is what leads to sin and death in, in our race. The human race has been like that ever since. So Jesus responds to the temptation by saying, look, it's not about the bread. It's not about my physical hunger. That's not what matters. What matters is the word of God. That's what we really depend on. And this is a great lesson for us because so many times we look around this world and we see things that we think will satisfy us. But the only thing that really satisfies is the relationship with God, being obedient to his word. That's what Jesus wants us to understand. That's how he overcomes the temptation. It's how he wants us to overcome the temptation. But that's not the end of it. That's just the first of the temptations. It says, after that, the devil brought Jesus into the holy city. And he stood him on the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, since you are God's son, there he is again, tempted him. I mean, you're the Messiah, right? It, anything you do is okay. Anything you want to do is just fine because you're God's son, right? He says, since you're God's son, throw yourself down. For it is written, I will command my angels concerning you. And they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on even one stone. Again, here's Satan twisting the truth. Here's the tempter. And he's, he's taking scripture and he's manipulating it to serve his purpose. See, let me tell you. In Jerusalem, at that time, the temple is 20-something stories tall. Beautiful. Huge. This thing's massive. Okay? If you go there and you look up, there's one place way out on a ledge at one point where a priest goes out several times a day with a horn to make announcements. And whenever he walks out there, everybody in the city stops and they look because they know something is going to be announced. It's either time for prayer or it's the beginning of the day or the end of the day or it's time for something important to be known, that's why he's up there. If Jesus had walked out there, every eye in the city would have stopped and beheld to see what he was going to do. And Satan's telling him, look, Jesus, you're choosing the way of the cross, which is suffering and shame. I'm offering you an easy way out. Because you know if you jump off of that place and you don't die, everybody will know who you are. And everybody will follow you. Jesus 
looks at him and he says, no, no. It is written, don't test the Lord your God. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we read where there was a, a, a pastor handling snakes in church. And some denominations still do that. And, and every time, I mean, it happens every few years. One of them gets bit by one of those rattlesnakes and dies. And every time I see that, I think of this, this passage. And I wonder what in the world, you know, that, that, that's supposed to be a test of faith. And every time I see that, I wonder, you know, about this, this scripture right here. It's like me going out there and waiting on Highway 6, you know, for a big 18-wheeler to come along and saying, Lord, I can't get the people to follow me in these ministries, so I'm just going to jump out here in front of this truck. And when you stop this truck, then they'll know. <laughs> That'll prove your love to me. <laughs> Probably not, you know. I mean, think about it. How much more does he have to do than to give himself up for us and suffer through all that on that cross to prove his love for us? His love is already proven. It's up to us to accept it. Jesus sees through the temptation here because he understands that what Satan is really trying to get him to do is take the easy way out, take the, the shortcut. Have y'all ever been tempted to take the shortcut? You know, I hated math. I hated math, and whenever I would look through a math problem, if I knew the answer, I just wanted to write the answer. I didn't want to go through all the steps and the processes. Y'all don't, y'all didn't, okay, maybe it's just me, that's all right. But you know, I, and any time I did, I was more apt to make a mistake and get the wrong answer, by the way. It wasn't the answer I thought it was. Jesus knew that if he would have started trying to get men to follow him like that, by bribing them, by being showy and showing off, that today's miracle would mean tomorrow there'd have to be two. And the day after that, there'd have to be three. I mean, you know how human beings are. Satisfying us is pretty difficult. You know, this is maybe not the greatest of analogies, but for those of us that love sports and football, think of the Super Bowl. I remember the first Super Bowl, they played a football game. That's all they did. And it was a great football game. Nowadays, it's like $10 million worth of halftime entertainment. And next year has to be better than this year's because this year was, I don't know about y'all, but I didn't think it was any better than last year. But, <laughs> but see, that's how human beings are. You know, when we're amazed at something today, it takes something even more amazing tomorrow to keep our attention. And it's not supposed to be like that. And Jesus knew that. And so he chose not to take the short. He chose to follow God's word and not to tempt the Lord. He says, Satan, that's not the way this deal works. He continues. Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said to Jesus, I'll give you all of these if you'll just bow down and worship me. Again, this is twisted scripture from what we would consider one of the Psalms. Because the psalmist writes that God will give to his Messiah all the kingdoms of the world. Here, Satan again trying to get Jesus to, to listen to the scripture presented in the wrong way. And you know, i got to tell you, there's a lot of places, and, and you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of places and a lot of people that will misuse scripture for their own selfish gain. Or they'll misuse it to try and get people to feel a certain way. To try and manipulate people into a certain response. For selfishness. And it's used wrong. And it's sad. You know, one of the things we need to remember is Jesus chose to, to look at this through God's eyes. To test things through his word and to stay with his word. He chose not to look at it through the eyes that he chose, which is, well... You know, maybe you're right. Maybe he didn't really mean I'd die. No, but that was the beginning of death for our human race. That was the beginning of sin through the disobedience. Jesus chose obedience to God. And when Satan offered him all the kingdoms, Jesus responded, get behind me, Satan, go away. It wouldn't be the last time he had to respond like that either, would it? Jesus says, because it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And so the devil left him, and angels came and took care of him. 
Jesus again would be tempted when he tells his disciples what he must suffer through. And Peter runs up to him and he says, Lord, there's got to be a better way than that. You don't need to die. You're the Messiah. You know, think about all of these things. That, and that's when Jesus cuts Peter off and he says, get behind me, Satan. You're tempting me again. When we look at, at these temptations, we need to understand that so many times we are our own worst enemy. So many times the struggle is in our own heart. You remember that Jesus, just a few weeks ago, we were, we were studying the scriptures, and Jesus says, you know, it's not what a man takes into his mouth as he eats that makes him unclean. It's the thoughts that come out of his heart. That's where the adulterous thoughts come from. That's where the thoughts of theft, that's where the thoughts of false witness come from. That's where the deceit lies. And so many times it's us ourselves that's our own worst enemy. Oh, maybe Satan doesn't walk up and tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, I got a great idea. These people will follow you. Take them down here, and if you do this, man, they'll follow you, and you got it made on easy street. You'll have the best job. You'll make the best living better than everybody else. No, so many times the way he works is not by walking up and getting in our face. It's by whispering in our ear, hey, you know, thought of a shortcut. If you did it this way, nobody will ever know. And it'll be so much easier. I want to ask you how many how many folks in Congress you think might have gotten elected there with the intention of serving? Really, really, really serving the best interest of the people. And then after a while, the system kind of wears them down. The system continues to tell them, hey, you were elected to office. They trust you. They love you. Whatever you want to do really is okay. Too many of our politicians today, they look at the Constitution and they think, well, I know it was written for that, but that's a long time ago. Maybe, maybe, we, could, maybe we could do a few things anyway in spite of what that Constitution says. I mean, a Christian would never look at God's word, the Bible, and say, I know that that scripture is good, but it's 2,000 years old. It doesn't work anymore, right? We, we'd never do that, right? Huh? Yeah. You see how the temptation works? Oh, that's just how they did it back then. It's not still good today. You know better. Besides, you know, if you go by that scripture, you just won't be happy. It's better that you're happy because you're a Christian, right? You said you love the Lord. You're going to follow Jesus. You got the bumper sticker. So, so anything, you got the T-shirt, right? So anything you choose to do is okay. We don't have that temptation, right? Good. I just wanted to check. <laughs> Let me read to you what Barclay says. And it's a little bit of a long reading, but he does such a, a wonderful job in putting this down. I want you to hear this. He says, a man has to be tested before God can use him for his purposes. Now, here is a great and uplifting truth. Barclay wants us to be encouraged. What we call temptation is not meant to make us sin. It is meant to enable us to conquer sin. It is not meant to make us bad. It is meant to make us good. It is not meant to weaken us. It is meant to make us emerge stronger and finer and purer from the ordeal. Temptation is not the penalty of being a man. Temptation is the glory of being a man. We're created in God's image, right? Okay. He said it is the test which comes to a man whom God wishes to use. When you're being tested, it's because God's trying to get you ready for something greater. It's not so he can watch you suffer. It's so he can watch you succeed and be victorious, but only when you follow him. He continues, so then... We must think of this whole incident not so much as the tempting, but rather the testing of Jesus. How many places in scriptures can you think of where it says we're to be refined? Like gold is refined. It takes a little heat to refine silver, I don't mind telling you. Sometimes it gets a little hot in our life when we're doing the right things. But God allows us to be tested. He allows us to be tempted. And sometimes it's not just so he can know whether we'll be faithful. Many times, 
I would argue that it's so we will know that we will be faithful. How many times have you talked to someone and they tell you, well, no, I just can't do that because I just don't trust myself. You ever heard that? Well, that's a sad thing. That really is a sad thing indeed. Because we're told in the scripture that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Jesus overcame these temptations and so can we. There's never anything that we need not be able to face if we're facing it with God at our side. He's preparing us for something great. Now, indeed, you don't trust, I'm sorry, you don't tempt the Lord God. You don't force him. You follow him. If he leads you to some place where you're tempted, he'll see you through it. But again, I don't think we need to be jumping out in front of 18 weavers and buses. You know, or in my case, I'm not going to hunt up a snake to pick it up either. But if he asks me to follow him, I hope that I'm up to it. See, Jesus shows us how to overcome these temptations. Jesus had to choose and trust fully in God. Too many times we're tempted tested to take what we know of God's word or of God and to misuse it. He, on the other hand, took what he knew of God and trusted in it. And it became the strength that he used to overcome the temptations. And it all boiled down to God's word. God's word. It's just as good today as it was when it was written. God's word will see us through all of the difficult times in life. And sometimes we need others' help in finding it. Sometimes we need to be in prayer. Sometimes we need to be fasting. Sometimes we need to reach out to a brother or sister in Christ and tell them what's going on so they can help us work through it. Sometimes we need to be reminded and encouraged by people that we trust who will remind us of God's word. That's how we get through temptation. That's how we get through testing. And that's how we emerge on the other side, more like Christ, and more able to deal with these difficult times. Are you willing to follow his lead? Are we here today willing to be like Christ and depend on the word of God? Not the bread of this life that we see, not the newer cars or the bigger houses or the promotion at the expense of someone else. Those things just don't satisfy. The only thing that satisfies is the Word of God. And the only thing that gets us through tough times and temptations is that same Word. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.